Aloha and welcome to your favorite party or Thursday afternoon. This is the Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I'm your co-host Justine Espiritu. Uh, my co-host Matthew Johnson is knee-deep delivering chard right now across the islands so he can't be with us today. Uh, today is exciting though. Um, the power of peer pressure brought two people we've been trying to get on the show for a while. So we're really excited to have them. Again, uh, the purpose of the Wife Food and Farmers series is to bring on all the individuals and organizations that have a place in our food system to kind of get the, the background and the history, see what people are doing, see what motivates them, and kind of get their perspective on what's next and what's coming up. So today we have Alina Harris and Nick Rapoon. Thank you guys for joining us. So Alina is at LCC. Um, go ahead and say your title. Sustainable Agriculture Specialist and Lab Manager. And Nick? I'm the Farm Manager at Kako'o OEV. Awesome. And in addition to that, you guys both work on your family's farm. And um, so you both have, I think, unique backgrounds, and I'm excited to bring you on to, to kind of talk about the, the different positions you've had and, and your background of what got you interested in agriculture and, and what's kind of brought you into these positions in Honolulu to kind of be leaders that are guiding people and talk about the work that you're doing in agriculture. So why don't we start with Alina? So you actually have a degree in sustainable ag and food production systems uh, from the University of New Hampshire. You got it. And so that was a new degree at the time, and it's kind of a new degree all around in terms of uh, a field of study. So if you kind of want to talk about what got you interested in that and what that kind of looked like and what it prepared you for. So I first fell in love with farming. I just started woofing. I'm sure you've talked about woofing on your show, um, worldwide opportunities for organic farming. Um, so I, I started doing it in Sweden when I was 18. I started farming um, as a work trade, um, just as a way of um, traveling for cheap, actually, and then fell in love with farming and was like, wow, this is totally it. Um, and uh, did that with my best friend. And at the time, I was already enrolled in business school at the University of New Hampshire. So I did that for a semester, and then I was just like, you know, I need to move more into the biological sciences and then just kind of made a pact with myself. I'm going to only study classes that I'm truly interested in. So then I moved into only agricultural classes and then never looked back. All the while was working on farms and um, getting in the dirt and um, soil, actually. Um, <laughs> um, and um, so... Um, Definitely, there's a lot of important science to be had in the books, um, but you also need to be um, also learning that alongside in the field. Mm -hmm. And so that was really, really important to me. All, everything that I was learning and getting A's on in my test, I was also learning in the field. And if so I didn't have in, that... In the program, did you have a uh, hands-on experience during the during the program in the university, or was it up to you to go find that experience? I did a little conference? bit in the university, but I was kind of, I was lacking that at the time. I think they've definitely stepped their game up since, um, and they've gotten a lot more place-based since, and it's a much better program now, I would say. Um, but I think I, I searched for that more at the time, and... Um, you were the guinea pig. Too. I was the guinea they pig, didn't, yeah. Because you were literally the first cohort the of this. Of this right, degree. so okay. um, at the time they didn't have that major, so I thought I was going to have to create my own major, and then luckily, uh -huh. right as I graduated, they were like, oh, sustainable agriculture and food production is uh -huh. major. So um, I just slipped through. Um, so yeah, and then um, right around that time is when I met Nick. And then in, New, in New Hampshire? No, I met him sure. in Hawaii, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then that's when I managed to land a job in New Hampshire, and um, I got his... Lured him over? <laughs> lured him over, got his got amazing resume <laughs> on a piece of paper, handed it over to the guy across the table and said, 
I think you ought to hire this guy too. <laughs> and um, okay, what was the name of that farm? Sanborn Mills Farm, and that was in Loudoun, New Hampshire. Okay, and then so why don't we back up a little bit here and talk about your background. So you have this resume and, and talk a little bit about your experience and you didn't have a degree at a college, no. but let's talk a little bit about uh, your upbringing and your family farm. Um, so my, my dad uh, and his brother have been farming for my entire life. So I was raised on our family farm. Um, and so like, as you said, I, I have no formal education in agriculture. I mean, I've taken science classes here and there mm -hmm. throughout, but um, everything that I've learned about agriculture has been through osmosis, just by being on the farm, being around my dad, my uncles. Um, and what about them? Did they get any sort of formal training or they just started the farm themselves and um, learned as they my, went along? My dad was an English major and he actually taught English for a little while. And then um, when his brother Paul graduated, he had a degree in botany, I think, um, and they decided that they wanted to kind of play around with farming, and um, they met they met some people who got them into um, growing taro, and so they were given a whole bunch of huli to plant out some of their first patches, and one of the things that was taught to them at the time is that you always keep planting so that you have, you know, sort of, you're always planting and always harvesting. You create a, okay. a crop rotation cycle. Uh -huh. And as they say it, they started doing that, and then all of a sudden, 30, 40 years later, here we are today, and they kind of just, like, got caught up in it. And um, Was there a particular impetus? They were just <coughs> interested in starting to grow things? Or were they interested in, in being more food secure, with, like, providing for themselves and their family? Was that, um, like, a... This is, the, in the, this is about the, the, the mid-70s, um, so there was, that was kind of um, at, at about the midpoint of the back, what they call the back to the land movement, which mm -hmm. happened basically after, the, after a lot of the sort of consciousness awakening of the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people were trying to get back to the land, get out of the cities, and so it was kind of like part of that. Wave. So a lot of their peers were doing similar things. There were, there were a lot of other people kind of looking to do similar things, um, and they kind of describe it as like they kind of came in on the tail end of it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was a big push for a while, and a lot of people went back to the land, so to speak, and, and stayed. But a lot of folks kind of tried it out for a while, and then realized that you know there were other they moved on. Mm -hmm. But they've kind of my dad and his brother kind of stuck with it. And, because mm -hmm. um, they're really, so that, from yeah. what I've heard of the of the Rapoons, they've really been this example of um, a successful farm, a successful family farm, and they are someone that these uh, programs like Go Farm constantly hear from. They do the the presentations in the uh, Ag Curious. Mm -hmm. People do a lot of field trips to their their farm or your guys's place. Is there anything particular that that you can think like stands out about your family farm that really makes them this kind of prime example of? Um, of sustainable agriculture and I think, I think one one of the aspects that is attractive for a lot of people is that we have a diversified farm system. So one of our main crops is taro, but there's, I mean, there's a list pages long of different crops that we grow. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are more for commercial production. Some of them are just for um, more like a homesteading kind of thing, just fruit trees and a handful of them where there's we only have one or two of each variety so not enough for market but enough for us to eat at home um, and so I think that that the the model of a diversified system has been something that's attracted people to that st their style of farming okay. um, our, our family farm is really uh, in in the spectrum of agriculture as a whole it it's on the micro scale. Um, we've got about three acres of taro and um, maybe about 14 acres total. So there's like orchards and mixed crops and some small dry land fields. But um, in comparison to a lot of other people farming, even in Hawaii, there's most farms are, are a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like an interesting mix of kind of like a homesteading lifestyle way of farming, but there's also commercial production. And 
both of their spouses have always had outside off-farm jobs okay, to yeah, supplement farm income, to... which is one of the other reasons why we've been um, successful, mm -hmm. I guess. But, yeah. So, and then how did the, the Rapoons farm <laughs> compare to what you've seen in, in your woofing across in uh, New Zealand and Sweden? Uh, in what way? Uh, or, okay, so the diversified ag way, the, the homesteading way, that the idea of having the commercial side as well as providing for yourself, is that, um, it's kind of unique here, how is mm -hmm. it um, from your experience in the, the farms through woofing? Yeah, I would say probably worldwide, um, unless you're really large scale and kind of, yeah, unless you're really large scale and have large equipment and are more monoculture than you have to have an outside job. It's, it's a harsh reality. So unfortunately, part of being sustainable is being financially sustainable. And so much of the time, we forget that in a diversified system. Um, so many of the organic and small farming <coughs> systems um, are not truly sustainable because they're not financially sustainable. And those are the ones that are so near and dear to my heart and the ones that I want so much to succeed and the ones that I, yeah, um, I mean, I the, think, the ones I that I believe in the most, yeah, but. There's, um, there's a mix. I mean, even yeah. within the U.S. and outside of the U.S., I think there's, there's quite a mix. I, sure. I think every country has a little bit of an agricultural industry, mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's a lot of small farms and most people don't hear about them because they're small farms and I so they're like kind they, of like under the radar. I feel like we are hearing about like it more, right? Aren't there more kind of studies showing that small farms can be successful, but it, it's about being diversified, it's about getting creative, it's about mm -hmm. um, value added now, it's about agro-tourism. Mm -hmm. Are those kind of things that you guys have been incorporating for a while at, at uh, the Raccoon's Farm, right? Um, yeah, are there not, some, not are so there much. Some new developments to try to we do to we do value added in. products mm -hmm. um, and kind of that's that's been uh, a big part of it making poi out of the taro that's one of our main ones um, but as the far I mean the farm has evolved over the last forty years yeah. so you know the, you kind of have to adjust depending on you know we can't really grow bananas anymore because of the bunchy top virus and we don't want to spray for aphids which are the okay. vector because it's organic and so we hardly grow any bananas anymore that used to be one of our primary crops like when uh -huh. i was a little kid so there's i think that's another key part of small farms is the ability to evolve adapt. and adapt uh -huh. to environmental conditions what's taken the place of a uh, banana for you guys then um cacao probably we've been planting cacao for maybe 15 years. And you, are you selling that to folks, um, buyers here on Oahu, or is that yep. getting exported, or it's yep. all? We sell it all locally. Oh, everything awesome. everything we sell is Madre sold locally. Chocolate. Madre Chocolate okay, is awesome. one of our primary buyers. And so then I want to ask, so coming from your different <coughs> backgrounds, what kind of projects did you have, or what did you guys do at this um, uh, Sanborn Mills farm? <laughs> So there we grew mixed vegetables, pretty much every vegetable that you can think of, um, we grew there. Um, and also um, maple syrup, we tapped during the winter months um, and boiled. And then we also grew lamb and experimented with some small beehives there. Awesome. So another cool. diversified system. Cool. We're actually <laughs> going to take a quick one minute break and then kind of get back to the yard projects that you had over Excellent. there. For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We are uh, here live on Mondays at 3 p.m. and we bring guests like our best health coach, Elena Maganto. Uh, eat well and follow her tips. Viva la comida saludable. Aloha, how you doing? Welcome to Ibachi Talk. I'm here, Gordo the Tech Star on Think Tech Hawaii. And I'm here with my good old buddy, Andrew the Security Guy. Hey everybody, how you doing? Aloha. Good to, have it, good, to, good to have Andrew here in the house. Please join us every Friday from 1 to 1.30 and follow us up on YouTube. And remember, as we say at the end of every show, how, how you, you doing? doing? Hello, my name is Crystal. Let me tell you, my talk show, I'm all about health. It's healthy to talk about sex. It's healthy to talk about things that people don't talk about. It's healthy to discuss things that you think are unhealthy because you need to talk about it. So I welcome you to watch Quok Talk and engage in some provocative discussions on things that do relate to healthy issues and have a well-balanced 
attitude in life. Join me. Aloha and welcome back to Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. Today we have Alina Harris and Nick Rapoon who have uh, various uh, capacities and roles. Um, right now Alina is at Leeward Community College and Nick Rapoon is at Kaka'o OEV. So we're really quickly kind of recapping um, your experience on the farm that you're working at on the East Coast. So again, just briefly, if you could say some of the, the projects you led or, or what you worked on, and then um, curious about the transition to coming back to, to Honolulu. So this farm was kind of the last one that you were kind of actively in uh, production. So again, what were kind of your, your favorite projects there that, or yeah, that you had your hand in? Um, we, so we tried to do a diversified system, so as Alina mentioned before, we were growing a lot of different vegetables, um, and we would go to farmer's markets, we had a small CSA, we did wholesale, so again, the theme, as much diversity as possible. Yeah. Um, for me, it was really different being there and growing. Um, for like the, just the climate is so much different. And right, yeah, I'm curious about, it's like about you that kind of comparison. you got to jam in everything like during the season. summer, and then it's like you do it all one time a year, and then you're done, uh -huh. and you kind of like take a break a little bit in the winter. Um, Does it give you more time to, to have a nice like plan in place on that kind of like kind off of. time? Yeah, it gives you that time to plan a little bit, buy your seeds. For us, we had lambing season. Um, and then we were boiling the maple syrup for a lot of the winter time wow. when Nick was still going surfing in, <laughs> um, That's in his wetsuit. Is that, um, do you miss some of those things? I mean, because um, maple syrup, so that's not something you can do here. Is oh, that yeah. something you miss or? Oh, yeah. We miss it, although it, it is was, very boring. Yeah, it was fun, um, but you're literally watching sap boil, boil. So okay for okay. like two I weeks straight yeah it was a, it was a unique experience though, yeah definitely. uh the really cool thing about sanborn mills is that we use draft power so meaning animal power so um so a cow is a female cattle and then the male is the bull and then if you an intact an intact male is the bull and then if you remove the testicles it um is uh, well, if you train uh, a bull that has its testicles <laughs> removed, it is an ox, and that's what we used. Um, and awesome. so we used oxen to plow our fields. As opposed um, to like large, heavy machines? Yeah. yeah, so sometimes we would use tractors to do the really heavy work, but besides that, we used oxen, um, trained animals. Okay. Um, as well as draft horses. Does anyone still do that in Hawaii? Or that was pretty unique Not to that, that farm? I um, I, it's, that was one of the main things that that farm was trying to do is it was kind of like a historic, so that, that Sanborn Mills farm was run by the Sanborn family for I think over a hundred years. Uh -huh. And then um, this guy ended up buying the farm and you know did a lot of building resurrection. There's some old water-powered mills and that was kind of his thing is basically creating like a you know an old-timey farm okay. rehabbing it and so they wanted us to use the draft animals because that's a traditional practice there. I would be so pissed. <laughs> that sounds good. It was actually pretty fun. Yeah. Um, I mean definitely a lot of a lot of work but um, it was, re it was, it was really cool. unique really fun and definitely a skill that's shouldn't be lost, especially when we're yeah. like looking at global warming and, oh, what if we don't have gasoline? Yeah, How true. are we going to plow our fields true. and what are we going to do? And so yeah. pretty refreshing. And instead of your tractor breaking and having an awful like gas spill in the middle of your land, it's like, oh, there's some manure, big deal. Okay. Okay. So yeah. then I want to talk about uh, coming back to Honolulu. And so what kind of motivated your transition away from actual production to kind of the roles you're in now? If you can kind of talk about your, your stint as the Go Farm coach and then what you're doing in your current position. Uh, so Nick was wanting to come home to Hawaii. And so I supported <laughs> that. And um, so then 
I got the job that I could with Go Farm. So rather than just, did you have the option to like, oh, let's just continue doing this, working on um, your family farm, but you wanted to kind of pursue a different path, so. Right, well we had. Well, we, we traveled between New Hampshire and Hawaii, we traveled for a good six months. So when we got here, we were pretty much broke. So we we're like, okay. we need to get like <laughs> kind of real jobs uh -huh. so we can, um, yeah you know, refill our bank accounts or whatever. But, uh, and, and then it's just also, you know, coming, stepping into my family's farm. They've been farming for so long that like almost every corner of our property has been planted or, you know, they're, they're using like everything. So uh -huh. there's, I mean, there wasn't like a lot of, it wasn't like there was like a whole couple of acres that we could start our own okay. new thing. And like you said, your father and uncle are still managing it. They're still, they're, that's they're their full-time thing. So there wasn't, yeah. I guess, there wasn't even really room for you guys to... Yeah, and we could, you know, we could squeeze in here and there, but... Um, and they're always open to it. They, they're always yeah. encouraging us to, but we wanted to go out and get our own jobs. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then um, you're... So taking that position with GoFarm... Um, if you can kind of talk about what you think of that uh, kind of focused training program versus like a, a degree. Would you say like mm -hmm. the degree you got is something like someone who wanted to farm should take or? Well, so I would say it depends. So if you are just looking to be an entrepreneur and farm um, and just have your own business farming, then Go Farm could be for you if you have the full drive and um, are willing to just do your own um, reading and own studying and ha you know can do your own observation and are just really dedicated and have that drive then that could be for you um, and if you're just willing to stop there or if you wanted to be maybe a farm manager or if you wanted to be a farm laborer or something like that then go farm would be great for you but I think that if you wanted to work for the USDA or the NRCS, or if you wanted to work for a university, or you know, be an okay, educator, so it's more like administrative or academic, okay. right? Or um, if you wanted to be a soil scientist or an entomologist, or um, if you wanted to be a farm consultant, then you would need to get a degree. You would need to, you know you would need to at least have a bachelor's of science or mm -hmm. a master's or be thinking about it. But then it's like in that, that topic area, there's so many of those little pieces that you do want to know as a farmer. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's so many people that think about, you know, farmers, there's this stigma that farmers are stupid and you don't need to know very much to farm, which is yeah, completely, you know everything. <laughs> it's just completely yeah. not true at all. Um, but, you know, so. <laughs> And then, okay, so yeah, what's your, your current position? What are you doing in that, in that position? In that position, right now I'm managing, so I'm considered a lab manager or academic support. So I'm supporting classes that are place-based learning. So a lot of these classes have labs, um, and the labs are outdoors, and my labs are gardens. And okay. so I'm making, so this right now... This isn't the Go Farm students, though. This is no. just folks in, in this is, academic uh, classes. Yeah, these are credited courses. So these are photos being shown right now. These, this is the horticulture class right now. That's, um, and they're planting in, their, in the raised beds right now. Um, they're planting some cucumbers. They're labeling their seeds that they're planting right now. Um, and so... And this is actually a Go Farm at Leeward Community College right here with their chard. Um, and yeah, so it's just supporting those classes and the instructors can't do everything. They can't put together the PowerPoints, grade the tests, as well as do the irrigations, as well as do all the pest management, as well as do all there's so many little nitty-gritty things to keep track of basically my job is to be taking observations every day and catching things and nipping them in the bud right as they happen or right before they happen and so these are are some of these people going into to food production or just like gardening in general and you get to kind of guide them in that hands-on experience and uh, a lot of these people well a lot of them are trying to steer into the plant biology and tropical agriculture program, which is an associate's degree. 
and then they can move on. It's a fully articulated program towards UH West Oahu, and then that's a uh, sustainable community food systems degree. Okay. Um, but not everybody does go that route. They could just get a certificate, or they could just take a singular class. Uh, if they wanted to just get their, some people just need to take a lab course or they just want to get um, their science credit out of the way and they could just take a class like that. I'm just saying a lot of times I'll, if I'm trying to sell the class to them, I'll say, oh, well, it's a nice way to get your science credit out of the way and go outside and yeah, do something and get your hands dirty and, yeah. and grow some things. So that's, that's cool. And how do you like that um, versus the uh, working on a farm? being out there, helping, helping kind of other folks, guiding them with like growing something. I like it. I, I really enjoyed the production farming a lot. It, it was really fun for me, but after a while it definitely, as you can see in this picture, breaks your back. Um, I love it, love it, but after a while it's, it, um, it becomes strenuous and you can only do it for so many years. Okay. And so then you have to move on to a different job and then <laughs> you know eventually I'll be a mother and I just I can't just be like out there being a laborer so I have to put on but, my big so girl we, pants. We actually only have a minute and a half left so really quickly I want to give you some time to talk about what you're doing at Kako EV and sure um, so we're kind of we do like three things there what well, Kako EV literally means to support native so we try and do that in three ways um, by doing traditional agriculture through taro farming. Uh, we're working on wetland restoration, which also happens through taro farming, and then also um, cultural education, which we do a lot of formal programs with schools, uh, but we also have sort of community days where people can come and get their hands and their whole bodies muddy, actually. Um, and we're actually gonna start doing a farmer training class as well, which is, will be similar to what Go Farm does, but mm -hmm. really geared towards um, traditional Hawaiian crops, particularly taro, because that's what what we can grow um, at our at our site. And what kind of duration is that timeline? Um, it'll be a four month program. Okay, and you're going to be leading that? Yes, I will be one of the teachers. Uh, our other lead educator at Kako EV, he'll be. We're going to co-teach it, and then we'll bring in a lot of specialists as well to do the stuff that we don't know. Awesome. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing Thank your experience, you, sharing what's going on with Thanks your family us. farm and love to hear what people are doing related to food production. So thank you guys. Thanks.